This section is segmenting the IP network and introduces the means for communication between IP networks in the enterprise. The forwarding of frames and switching has introduced the data link layer operations, and in particular the role of IEEE 802-based standards as the supporting underlying communication mechanism over which upper layer protocol suites generally operate. With the introduction of routing, the physics that define upper layer protocols and internetwork communication are established. An enterprise network domain generally consists of multiple networks for which routing decisions are needed to ensure optimal routes are used in order to forward IP packets or datagrams to intended network destinations. This section introduces the foundations on which such IP routing is based. So upon completion of this section, it is generally expected that trainees will be able to explain the principles that govern IP routing decisions, as well as explain the basic requirements for packet forwarding. Prior to understanding the principles of routing within an enterprise network, it is important to be clear as to what exactly comprises of an enterprise network. The term autonomous system refers to a form of domain in which the scope of an enterprise is encompassed. The autonomous system is referred to as one or a group of networks that are generally managed by one or more network operators and is operated on the foundations of a single and clearly defined routing policy. This effectively refers to networks that may exist in a single physical location or spread across a remote geographic distance but are in some manner operating as a single network domain following the rules of a single business entity. Originally, this involved a single routing protocol, but in today's enterprise networks may consist of a variety of routing protocols that function in a collective manner. Much of the focus of switching and multi-switch operation that we have introduced has focused on a single broadcast domain that has been understood to encompass a number of collision domains as a result of switch introduction. We now take a step further to look at how routers that operate as network gateways provide the capability to not only generate multiple broadcast domains, but to support the transmission of data between these domains. Each broadcast domain will commonly represent a single network for which routers will support the routing of data between local area networks. And it is in this section that we will look into how this is performed. It is the role of the router to make the necessary decisions that allow data to be forwarded along an optimal path in order to reach the intended IP destination. The main questions here are exactly how are these decisions made and what are the primary factors on which these decisions are based. In order to answer this, we must firstly understand that most network destinations exist in networks that are located beyond the physical scope of a router. As such, a router is not able to rely solely on itself in order to discover these networks. It depends on route information from neighboring routers to provide this information and based upon which a router can make decisions as to the path that should be taken. The type of information that is used to make decisions depends on the routing protocol that can be understood as a set of rules for routing, rules that must be adhered to by all peers. The decisions for routing are based on the IP routing table that is found contained within every device capable of supporting Layer 3 based operations, which includes end stations, routers and even Layer 3 capable switches. The IP routing table generally gathers routes from various means including directly connected hardware, manually defined routes and dynamic routing protocols active on the router. These routes are then communicated to another table referred to as the forwarding information base or FIB that supports a faster lookup process when referencing the routing table. The forwarding information base will contain routes less than or equal to the number found in the IP routing table. The key information in the routing table includes the destination and mass, which we should already be somewhat familiar with. In addition, we have the protocol field, which lists the means by which the route was learned, which in this output shows as being learned via the directly connected hardware. The preference is associated with the means by which the route was learned in order to determine the level of reliability of the method used to learn the route. The cost represents the metric for the route as a measure of the path distance to reach the listed destination. The next hop also defines a crucial part of the routing process that is used to determine where the route is intended to be forwarded in order to reach the next routing device along the path to the intended destination if a routing device is present. In this instance, the routes are special routes that are locally defined, and therefore the next hop in this case is also local. The interface represents the outbound interface via which packets are transmitted. Determining the route that a packet is to take in order to reach the intended destination is defined based on three rules. The first of those rules is known as the longest match. It is possible for a routing table to have routes that offer multiple paths to the same destination, 
and therefore the first step in determining which route should be chosen is to decide which route offers the most accurate match to the IP destination. The details of this go back once again to the IP addressing in which a comparison of the destination IP address is made to the routes listed in the IP routing table. As an example, RTA contains two routes for the destination network of 10.1.1.0. However, one entry has a network mask of 24 bits, while the other has a network mask of 30 bits. This basically refers to the network on which routers B and C are connected. And if a ping to the destination of 10.1.1.1 was performed, the comparison would be initiated. When the address of 10.1.1.1 is converted to binary, we will find that all but the very last bit matches the two network addresses. The routing entry of 10.1.1.0/24, however, only attempts to match the first 24 bits, which is possible. However, since the network entry of 10.1.1.0/30 will match 30 bits of the 10.1.1.1 address, this entry represents the longest match and therefore is used as the forwarding route to this destination. If we find that two routing entries in the IP routing table provide the same longest match result, the routing decision will assess based on the second rule, that is based on preference. It is possible to have multiple means by which routes are learned, and we can see examples of those here in the form of direct routes, static routes, and other forms of dynamic routing protocols. Each routing method contains a preference value that measures the considered reliability of the protocol based on the perspective of the product vendor. As such, any time that routes are learned that contain an equal longest match value but are learned via different routing methods, it is possible to distinguish which routing entry should be used. A lower preference value represents a more preferred route, and therefore a direct route is considered the most preferred. In this example, two dynamic routing protocols represent the routes to the network 10.1.1.0 with an equal longest match of slash 30. However, since the OSPF protocol is considered to have a lower preference value, it is preferred over the protocol name RIP that has a higher default preference. Where it is found that the preference is also unable to be used to distinguish between routes, the routing decision falls to assessment of the route based on the third rule, that is based on metrics. Equal preference values may occur if the routing protocol that is defining equal routes happens to be the same protocol with the same preference value or possibly the same preference value of another protocol that has been manually changed. We show here the situation based on the same protocol containing two routes to a destination with an equal longest match and an equal preference. The metric values, however, are shown for these routes to have costs of 50 and 100. The lowest cost value represents the better cost metric and will be used within the IP routing table and forwarding information base. Before the IP routing table is capable of supporting the communication of routes to the forwarding information base, it must, as a minimum for each destination network, know the interface via which the packet is to be forwarded and the next hop that is expected to receive the packet. So this brings us to the summary for this section in which we have a couple of questions. The first asks, what is the order in which routing decisions are made? Well, if we recall, routing decisions are made by firstly looking for the longest match route. If two or more routes represent an equal longest match, the preference is used to determine the most preferable route. If the preference value is also equal for the routes, the metric value is used to distinguish between the routes. Secondly then, what does the preference represent? Well, the preference is a measurement of the considered general reliability of each method of routing. A directly connected route discovered via a hardware connection is considered the most preferable, whilst the different dynamic routing protocols will have a vendor-assigned preference associated with them. 